Addicted to food? Is food your drug of choice? This is a question that I know a lot of people need answered because the secrets are that sugar and salt are your addictions and this is maybe the reason why you are not getting the results that you want. Addicted to food. This is so important because so many people are using food as their drug of choice. Is that you? Are you using food as your comfort? Are you using food to make you feel good because you're not getting that reward from other areas in your life? People use food for multiple reasons. I always say food is fuel. Food is not there to entertain you. Food is not there to make you feel good. Even though, you know, if you go back to many, many people when they were kids, a lot of parents used to use food as the reward. And I'm sure you can identify with this. I mean, that used to happen with us when we were kids at times. You know, if we were a good little boy or good little girl, mum would say, okay, if you're a good boy or a good girl, you can have a lolly or a biscuit or a chocolate or whatever. And they were only brought out on special occasions or to uh, reward us for doing something well or doing something, you know, obeying orders or whatever. Now, there becomes a problem here because then you then start creating that neural pathway which then allows your brain to think, well, every time I do something well or every time I need to reward myself or any time I feel down and depressed or uh, have a low self-esteem, my go-to is food. So you got to ask yourself this question because this is what keeps people trapped in their body and keep people trapped in that addiction to food. And then they become addicted to sugar and salt and certain food items. You know, food can be such a powerful uh, addiction and we don't want it to be an addiction. You need to be in control of food. Food shouldn't be in control of you. And if food is your drug of choice, then we've got a serious problem. Now let's have a look at what's going on here in the brain. There are five ways that your body releases the feel-good chemicals, like dopamine and the endorphins and so on. And the first one is when you're in love. Now if we just go back a little bit, the moment that you were born and your mum delivered you and, they, and the nurses or doctors placed you in your mum's arms the moment you were born. There was an instant release of oxytocin, instant feel-good chemical between you and your mother. And that was an unbreakable bond. So it doesn't matter how much you upset your mum or it doesn't matter how much. And if you look at it the opposite way, if you're, if you're a mum and you've had children, I can imagine the feeling that you got the moment that your child was born and they placed that child in your arms and that instant feeling of love and gratitude and just overwhelming emotion that this little being is now part of you and came from you. So men experience it as well, but women experience it more because they're the ones that all the hormone changes and so on that occur during pregnancy and then the massive rush of endorphins at that time when the baby's born. So the first primal uh, emotion and release of serotonin and these, these endorphins are the feeling of being in love. And there's no better feeling than a child and a mother. We then move further forward in a person's life and the first time they feel the butterflies in their stomach when you know, they, they hit puberty and you know, there's that girl or that boy that they feel like they're in love with. And this is, again, the confusion between lust and love. Everyone assumes that it's love, but in the first you know, statistics show in the first six months to two years, it's actually lust. And you probably can associate, uh, you know, identify what I'm talking about. That first time you met your partner 
and you just have this feeling that I need to see them all the time. That's that rush of endorphins, that feel-good chemical. They make me feel good and I feel good when I'm with them. I know that, that I feel that when I first met my wife, Lucy. You know, and even now, I still have a rush of endorphins every time I look at her and I, I appreciate the things that she does for me and the things that I'm able to do for her. And we've been married for 23 years and we've been together for 26 years and we still are madly in love with each other because we're always trying to do things for each other. Where a lot of people, they lose that as their relationship continues on throughout their life. So there's a major anti-release of endorphins because they don't feel like they're in love anymore. So the primal release is in, of endorphins is being in love. The second one is drugs and alcohol or some form of addiction. So it could be gambling, it could be drugs and alcohol. You know, any form of addiction, a negative addiction. You choose what that is, you know what I'm talking about. That is another very destructive way of releasing endorphins. And you've seen, you know, certain people that play the pokies and they're addicted to playing the pokies. People that are addicted to gambling, people that are addicted to um, all forms of uh, money and betting and things like that. Their ways, so every time you win at something or every time you're challenged and you win, you keep chasing that win, keep chasing that win because your brain is releasing those endorphins that make you want to do it again because it makes you feel better. So you've got being in love, you've got drugs and alcohol, you've got sex. The last two are exercise. So exercise releases endorphins. It makes you feel good. I did a workout earlier today and I feel absolutely fantastic because I you know, exerted myself, I got the blood rushing through my body, the blood's rushing into the brain, oxygen's going into the brain, and I feel a million bucks. And that's why exercise is one of the most powerful releases of feel-good chemicals. But the last one, the fifth one, is food. And food can be such an addictive substance. And out of all of the five, food is is the one that is a necessity. Without food, you die. You don't have to be in love. You don't have to be addicted to sex. Uh, to sex. Well, you, sometimes you don't, have to, you don't have to have sex. You don't have to be addicted to drugs or alcohol or gambling or any of those sort of things. That's not a necessity. You don't have to exercise. And you know, 86% of the population don't exercise. So that leaves one thing that you must do in order to stay alive, which is eat. And that becomes the most common thing that people get addicted to. That's why food addiction is more prevalent than any other form of addiction. There was a study done, I can't remember now who did the study, but I remember clearly, because it was many, many, many years ago, they got a bunch of mice and they had one group that they got them to have cocaine and another group that they got to have a very high sugar I won't mention what the sugar biscuit was but it was a very high sugar cookie or biscuit and they then looked at the um, a reaction of the two mice when they took those substances away from the two groups and they found that the mice that were addicted to the sugary biscuit or cookie had worse withdrawal symptoms because everyone gets withdrawal symptoms when you give something up. You know what that feels like when you give up, say, coffee or you know, drugs or alcohol or uh, certain foods like sugar and salt. You get headaches. You feel very flat. And that's your body trying to detox. So these mice were detoxing from the sugar from that biscuit and the, co and the other group were detoxing from the cocaine. And they found the, mouse, the, the mice that detoxed from the uh, sugar, from the biscuit, were a lot worse than the ones from the cocaine. So it just goes to show that the sugar, sugar is a worse addiction than cocaine. And then what they did, they put the group back together, both groups in one, and they gave them a choice as to what they were going to go to. And the majority of the mice went to the sugary biscuit 
than they did to the cocaine. Now, I'm not saying you've got to have cocaine instead of sugary biscuits, but it just goes to show how powerful food can be as, as an addiction because it is a necessity. So you have a choice in what food you eat. You have a choice in how you prepare your meals. Now, we talked about that in previous episodes, and I encourage you, if you haven't listened to previous episodes or watched the episodes, if you're watching this on YouTube, go back to those previous episodes on food prepping because maybe that's what you need to do in order to break the addiction of food. And you know whether you're addicted to food because people say to me all the time, oh, but I get cravings. I get cravings for sugar. I get cravings for salt. If I don't have salt on my food, food doesn't taste nice. If I don't finish off my meal with some sort of sweet, I don't feel like I've completed my meal. I get people that say to me, Tony, I... I always need to have some chocolate every day. Now, I understand that, especially for females, when it's that time of the month, the hormones are going crazy. And in that case, sugar can be very addictive. But that's where it becomes very destructive because when you're addicted to those foods and you're constantly eating those foods, there's substances in, there's substances in those foods that cause people to want more of it. And that's where it becomes a problem. And that's where food controls you instead of you controlling food. The best way to overcome this addiction is to not have it around. You can't eat what you can't see. So if you have things that are high in sugar or salt or things that are addictive like alcohol and so on in your house, get rid of it. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Sure, you're going to feel like crap the first few days or maybe a week while your body's detoxing. Drink lots of water. You don't need those substances. We say eliminate anything white. Eliminate salt and sugar. That's white. Eliminate dairy. People are addicted to milk and milk-based products, dairy-based products that cause mucus and so on. And you know how you feel when you have these substances. You get a bit of a rush, you feel phenomenal. You know, you've got all this energy and all of a sudden you get dumped in about five, 10 minutes and you feel like you need to have a sleep. Same with the salt. When you're addicted to salt, water rushes into your body, you need to drink gallons and gallons of water and then you feel bloated and you feel crap. You don't need that. If you eliminate these foods out of your diet, you'll probably find that you'll get the results that you want to get. Otherwise, all you're going to be doing is yo-yo dining. You go on a diet, you break the diet, and then you start eating the foods that you were eating before because that neural pathway is still there. Like we said in previous episodes, it takes 21 days or three weeks to form a habit. So if you want to break the addiction of food, if you want to stop the addiction of sugar, if you want to break the addiction of salt, because they're the two main ones, You have to just totally go cold turkey and eliminate them. But when you do that, you need to replace them with something else. Now, sure, if you're addicted to sugar and salt and, you know, certain foods that are high in those um, uh, substances, when you go and eat greens, greens are going to taste very bland. I get people saying to me all the time, but how can you eat that food, Tony? Don't you find it bland? And I constantly say, listen, food doesn't have to entertain me. I live the six and one rule. Six good meals, uh, six good days, one bad day or one bad meal. We talked about this again in previous episodes. If you need to go back and watch or listen to our Look Good, Feel Great podcast earlier episodes, go back and watch those episodes. And while we're on it, if you love what you're listening to, please, please, please give us a five-star rating give us a review, subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with as many people as you possibly can because if we can get this message out to people and we can help people, our goal here at Better Than Ever is to help as many people as we possibly can be the best version of themselves. That's why we constantly say we want you to look good and feel great. And I feel great every single day of my life. I love it. Sure, there's days that I feel flat, But because I know how to get myself out of it, because I've got the right mindset and I'm not addicted to food, it's easy for me to do that. And I want the same thing for you. I don't want you to feel sluggish. I don't want you to feel 
you know, unhappy when you try to put clothes on and they don't fit you. I don't want people to look at you and you feel embarrassed that you're bursting out of your clothes or people are looking at you like, oh, gee, they, they look like they've put on a bit of weight. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for anybody. And you can change that. But if you've got an addiction to food, it's going to be very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. So we need to then look at those other four areas that your body releases serotonin or your brain. Serotonin is made in the stomach, by the way, if you're not sure. So there's a brain uh, digestive system, brain body connection, gut connection, mind body connection. So you need to make sure that that connection is tight. And when you're producing you know, the wrong chemicals in your stomach and you're feeling like crap, that affects your mind. You know what it's like when you feel foggy and sluggish and tired all the time and you can't get out of bed. Of course, you've got so much junk going on in your head. You know, your body's infiltrated with chemicals that it doesn't need and it's constantly trying to eliminate it. So your body's full of acid and when it's full of acid, it can't focus on fat burning. Acid gets stored in your fat cells. So in order to detox your body, so things like sugar and salt and uh, high acidic foods and junk food, they're high in acid, they're storing your fat cells. So you'll, you might be killing yourself in exercise and you're not getting the results. Why? Because you're not doing the right thing with the food. And like we said before, 80% of what you look like is what you eat. So there's no point exercising seven days a week for five hours a day like some people do and then you complain that you're not getting the results if you're not gonna eat right. And there's no point in saying, I need to eat right, and you only eat right one day out of the seven, because you know you wanna detox quickly because you wanna get ready for that party that you got on the weekend, and then the, the rest of the time you're eating crap because you're addicted to sugar and salt and other substances. You need to break this addiction. You need to be disciplined enough to say to yourself, okay, for the next three weeks, I'm gonna eliminate these foods out of my diet. I'm going to totally eliminate them. I'm going to go into my pantry. I'm going to go into my fridge and I'm going to just throw them in the bin. And if I'm around people that are eating these foods, I'm just going to walk away. Now, I know that's difficult sometimes. And I get a lot of people saying to me, especially mums that go, oh, yeah, but what am I going to cook for the family? What do you mean what are you going to cook for the family? Or what about when people come over? You know, I've got to give them something to eat. And I always say to people, but hold on a minute. When I come to visit you, I don't come to visit you to eat your food. I come to visit you because I want to see you. And that's the type of attitude that you need to have. When you go and see someone, go and be present with that person. Don't go there because you need to eat their food. Don't go there because you feel like you need to give people food in order to be hospitable and show them that you love them. They know that you love them. That's why they're coming to see you. You don't need to make them fat. You know, you don't need to encourage that addiction. You need to help them. And if we all help each other, it's all going to be a lot better. So you need to go back to those other four areas and rekindle your relationship with your partner to get that feeling of love. Tell your partner, your husband, your wife, whoever it is that you love them. Tell your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your kids, Tell them that you love them. Rekindle that love. Go back to the primal feeling and the release of serotonin. Then forget about those other negative addictions and focus on exercise. Exercise is the best way, other than being in love, to release your feel-good chemicals and you're doing two things. You're helping the mind and you're helping the body. And it's so important for you to focus on that. So start with that. Start by going for a walk and then start by cleaning out your fridge and your pantry and start eating healthy foods. Green. Go green. Eat as much green stuff, live food as you possibly can. It'll nourish you. Eliminate the things. I like I always say, if it doesn't grow on a tree and it doesn't come out of the ground, just don't eat it. Focus on those things and you'll totally clean your body up and you'll eliminate that addiction. And it's freeing to eliminate the addiction. That's what you need to do. Eliminate that addiction. Just try this for three weeks. 21 days. I'm going to throw a challenge out to you. For 21 days, I want you to try and not eat anything that you think you're addicted to. I want you to try and exercise every day and make exercise your new form of 
release of endorphins. I want you to say to your partner, your kids, or whoever you love or you were in love with, I love you every single day for the next 21 days. And I guarantee when you get to day 21, you want to continue it. And I encourage you to reach out to us and tell us how you're going. Leave some comments for us. Tell us, Tony, it worked. And I guarantee it will work. Because as we always say, results start here. Everybody deserves to be better than ever.